Mi dai? Ah, ok, ci siamo. Buon pomeriggio a tutti. Direi che uh, è ora di iniziare questa sessione. Buon pomeriggio a tutti voi. Benvenuti a questa terza e ultima sessione del convegno Cantare alla polifonia da Jean Schedepré a Philippe de Monte. Singing polyphony from Jean Schedepré to Philippe de Monte. E, e come sapete questo, uh, questa sessione uh, coincide con... Uh, l'anniversario eh, della morte di John Scan, il 27 agosto di 500 anni fa. Quindi questa è una, direi che è una, forse non c'è occasione migliore, modo migliore per ricordare eh, il maestro. Abbiamo quattro relazioni in programma che si annunciano molto interessanti su aspetti stilistici ed esecutivi dell'era di John Scan nonché uno su, problemi più pensanti, su, su uno dei problemi più pressanti della ricerca joskeniana, quello della paternità delle sue opere. So, briefly, we are uh, gathered here today for the third session of the uh, conference. Um, we have a lineup of uh, four uh, papers that promise to be quite engaging on stylistic aspects of Renaissance music. Uh, and specifically, the first one is on a pressing problem of Josquin research, uh, namely the problem of the attributions or the canon, what, what, the man, what Josquin actually wrote and what, what he did not write. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to the first speaker. We are uh, delighted to have here uh, Professor Jesse Rodin, uh, alla mia sinistra. Uh, Jesse è professore associato di musica a Stanford University. Uh, ha pubblicato uh, Josquin's Rome, Hearing and Composing in the Sistine Chapel, Oxford Press, uh, 2012. Ha pubblicato un volume di messe sulla, sulla melodia del Long Arme per la New Josquin Edition, di cui sentirete molto... Ora, eh, è coeditore della Cambridge History of 15th Century Music e, e dirige inoltre, come avete sentito, il, il coro uh, Cut Circle, uh, con cui esegue musica di questo periodo uh, in tutto il mondo. Um, Jesse ha ricevuto premi e borse di studio dalla Guggenheim Foundation di, di Université Libre de Bruxelles, the American Council of Learned Societies, the American Society of Composers, Authors and Publishers, the Harvard University Centers for Italian Renaissance Studies, forse qui meglio nota, here better known as, uh, uh, meglio nota come Villa Itatti, uh, e, e, e altri riconoscimenti. Uh, attualmente Jesse lavora una monografia sulla dimensione o dimensioni temporali della polifonia quattrocentesca. Um, so Jesse Rodin is associate professor of music at Stanford. He's the author of Josquin's Rome, Hearing and Composing in the Sistine Chapel, Oxford 2012. He has received many awards for his research and performances. An in-progress book for Cambridge University Press explores how 15th century polyphony happens in time. Please welcome me, Jesse Rodin. Oh, I should say, The title, of, the title of this presentation is the uh, Jean Scan Canon, the Jean Scan Research Project. Thank you, Jesse. Grazie, Stefano, per l'introduzione molto generosa. E, e devo dire anche per un, un, una centinaia di cose, uh, soprattutto con la traduzione del mio testo in italiano. For English speakers, I created a side-by-side -side version. So if anyone wants to see the text also in English, Um, I know there is a link where it's online. Do, would anybody benefit from that? I know there are people in the room who have the link. No. Okay. Allora. Il mio primo intervento è su un argomento su cui tutti sembrano avere un'opinione. 500 anni dopo la morte di Josquin, il problema dell'attribuzione delle sue composizioni continua ad assillare gli studiosi, anche se tende principalmente a stimolare battute, come 
La messa in si minore è ovviamente un'opera di Josquin. Tali reazioni sono comprensibili per due, due motivi. La prima è che la situazione è veramente complessa. All'ultimo conteggio c'erano 345 opere in qualche modo in gioco, di cui il canone delle composizioni autentiche rappresenta indiscutibilmente solo una frazione. La seconda ragione è che gli studiosi non hanno mai stabilito dei criteri oggettivi per valutare la paternità di Josquin, o, per essere più precisi, non ha mai concordato e messo in pratica né un insieme di criteri né una metodologia pratica. Sebbene il problema dell'attribuzione sia nell'aria fin dagli albori degli studi giosquiniani, probabilmente il primo passo sostanziale verso la sua risoluzione fu fatto nel 1974 al 76 dal comitato che pianificava quello, quella che sarebbe diventata la New Josquin Edition. Cercando di rendere conto di tutte le ascrizioni a Josquin, comprese quelle che non erano note ai redattori, redattori dell'edizione precedente, la edition sviluppò un'ammirevole metodologia fondata su un attento studio delle fonti musicali. Ciononostante, questa metodologia rimaneva imperfetta per due ragioni. In primo luogo, ai redattori non fu spiegato come si dovesse determinare la fidibilità delle fonti. In secondo luogo, nel caso di un'opera di attribuzione incerta, l'incarico della de, de, New Josquin Edition di determinare, cito, la relativa compatibilità dell'opera con la nostra visione della, dello stile di Josquin trascurò di considerare se tale visione dipendeva in parte da pezzi la cui attribuzione a Josquin era dubbia sulla base delle fonti. Se può sembrare che questa debolezza avrebbe dovuto essere facilmente evitabile, dobbiamo riconoscere che mai dalla morte di Josquin in avanti è stato possibile iniziare da zero collettivamente cioè ricominciare da capo a partire dalla sola evidenza delle fonti, mettendo da parte qualsivoglia quadro stilistico che si fosse già sviluppato sulla base della letteratura pubblicata e del canone ricevuto. Nei suoi ormai completi volumi crit critico commentari, 28 in tutto, la Nujoskan Edition offre quasi tutte le informazioni necessarie per realizzare proprio questo studio delle fonti. Ma negli anni precedenti l'apparizione del primo volume, il comitato di pianificazione della New Josquin Edition aveva adottato un approccio molto meno ampio al problema, così come aveva fatto, con una sola eccezione, una conferenza su questo stesso tema tenutasi a Utrecht nel 1986. In altre parole, alla fine degli anni Ottanta, il problema dell'attribuzione delle opere giosquiniane era stato del tutto accantonato. Il massimo che il comitato editoriale poteva chiedere era una valutazione di, cito, qualsiasi prova che sollevi dubbi sulla paternità di una data opera. Sembra quindi appropriato concludere che per mezzo secolo lo studio di Josquin è rimasto invischiato in un circolo vizioso, anche se, se nella New Josquin Edition sono apparse montagne di informazioni preziose, abbiamo continuato a fare affidamento in varia misura su un corpus e un quadro stilistico sviluppati senza tener conto di quelle informazioni. Non c'è dunque da meravigliarsi se molti studiosi, inclusi i redattori della New Josquin Edition, abbiano trovato frustrante un approccio che procedeva con due passi avanti e uno indietro. E se dovessimo davvero iniziare da zero? Se il problema fosse così profondo da rendere insufficienti i dubbi che si possono naturalmente sollevare a proposito di questo o quel lavoro. Alla conferenza di Utrecht dell'86, Joshua Rifkin, basandosi su approcci al problema dell'attribuzione adottati in altri campi, 
propose di fare proprio questo, ma il suo stesso sottotitolo, alcune osservazioni in politiche, rivelava quanto fosse difficile persino affrontare l'argomento. Per diverse ragioni le proposte di Rifki non sono state adeguatamente comprese e tantomeno adottate, non ultima il fatto che Rifkin pubblicò le sue opinioni proprio mentre la New York Edition si stava mettendo in moto. Nel corso di quest'ultimo anno, Rifkin ed io abbiamo lavorato insieme per mettere in pratica la metodologia da lui esposta nell'86. Negli ultimi decenni sono venute alla luce così tante nuove informazioni sulla vita e la musica di Josquin che questo sembra il, il momento ideale per affrontare di nuovo il problema. Una completa esposizione di questa metodologia apparirà in un articolo su Early Music del prossimo autunno. In questa sede posso solo limitarmi a offrirne una sintesi. Rifkin ha suggerito che l'unico approccio sensato al problema è quello di trattare le attribuzioni a Josquin più o meno come false o almeno sospette fino a prova contraria. Ora, quelli di noi che godono dei benefici di sistemi giuridici presumibilmente democratici possono in un primo momento trovare questa nozione scomoda. Ma Qui non stiamo parlando di plotoni d'esecuzione, non stiamo parlando di persone, non stiamo nemmeno parlando di musica, solo di attribuzioni a cui potremmo credere o meno. Coloro che si oppongono alla pratica della de-attribuzione tendono a lanciare l'accusa di hero worshiping, cioè di mitizzare l'autore, e di voler purificare il canone di pericolosi intrusi. L'obiezione è giusta nella misura in cui alcuni hanno cercato, in modo poco convincente, di limitare la lista delle opere di Josquin sulla base della percepita qualità musicale. La critica del leader worship è però essa stessa viziata del fa dal fatto che attribuisce a ai deattribuzionisti l'influenza dell'ideologia mentre accetta acriticamente il canone ricevuto come frutto di una posizione predefinita, non ideologica. Infatti il canone tradizionale, così come è stato modellato da Glareanus a Ambrose e da Ostoff a Noble, è tutt'altro che neutrale. Per venire al dunque, come si raggiunge l'obiettivo di valutare e, se necessario, eliminare le attribuzioni spurie dal canone di Josquin. Il metodo procede, procede in tre fasi. Il primo passo è quello di valutare l'attendibilità delle singole fonti che recano le attribuzioni. Il secondo passo consiste nel mettere in relazione le fonti utilizzando le tecniche della critica testuale per capire dove nella trasmissione di un determinato brano compaiono le attribuzioni a Josquin. Perché un pezzo possa rientrare nella nostra categoria più sicura, esso deve recare un'attribuzione in almeno una fonte ritenuta così vicina al compositore da poter essere usata come testimone inappuntabile, oppure in almeno due fonti che possono essere dimostrate essere indipendenti l'una dall'altra e che possano essere ritenute attendibili sulla base dei loro luoghi di origine, delle loro lezioni musicali e della complessiva credibilità delle loro attribuzioni. Il numero delle attribuzioni di per sé non è un criterio di giudizio, in talune circostanze anche un alto numero di, numero di attribuzioni potrebbe non essere sufficiente ad accoglierle. Anche le attribuzioni contrastanti non sono molto importanti. Certo, un pezzo ritenuto in prima analisi falso ha maggiori possibilità di rimanere tale se compare anche un, in una fonte che lo attribuisce con un certo grado, grado di plausibilità ad un altro autore. Come regola generale, meno famoso il compositore, più credibile l'attribuzione. Ma partendo da una presunzione di colpevolezza, 
la mancanza di un'attribuzione conflittuale non aumenta in modo misurabile la probabilità della paternità di Josquin. Resta necessario dirimere l'attribuzione sulla base dei suoi meriti interno, cominciando dalle fonti che attribuiscono il lavoro a Josquin. Utilizzando questa metodologia, Rifkin ed io abbiamo stabilito un nucleo di 54 messe, mottetti e canzoni. Il prossimo passo è quello di usare questo corpus centrale per impostare i parametri del linguaggio e della tecnica compositiva di Josquin e per sviluppare una sensibilità musicale per discriminare fra quello che Josquin tipicamente fa o non fa in determinati contesti. È qui che può tornare utile il Josquin Research Project che oggi ospita 342 opere di Josquin permettendo di stabilire norme e valutare eccezioni con un, ri un rigore senza precedenti. Invece di bandire le opere spurie, includiamo tutto nel nostro database insieme alla musica di compositori da Guillaume Dufay a Ludwig Zenfel. Vorrei ora dare un, una breve dimostrazione di come il Josken Research Project può aiutarci a considerare la questione delle norme e delle eccezioni. Anche il pezzo attribuito in modo più sicuro potrebbe contenere un'apparente anomalia, ad esempio un tipo di dissonanza relativamente raro nel corpus sicuro. In tal caso, ulteriori scavi analitici di solito rivelano che, che l'anomalia non è affatto anomala. Ecco un famosa, famoso esempio, poi citato da Zarlino, che è conservato in tutte le fonti sopravvissute della Missa Lomarmé Sextitoni, una quarta accentata in tessitura a due voci. Vedete? Sì, è un, po', un po' piccolo però. Questa situazione contrappuntistica è insolita nel corpo sicuro di Josquin, ma dall'altra parte il pezzo sembrerebbe ora datare del 1480, quando il trattamento della dissonanza di Josquin era più libero di quanto non lo sarebbe stato negli anni intorno al 1500. Inoltre, la dissonanza non è priva di riscontri diretti tra le opere sicuro, sicure, è ciò che chiameremmo appoggiatura accentata, o vicino superiore. All'interno del movimento contrapuntistico non sconvolge molto le cose, in particolare nel contesto di un lavoro sostanzioso che altrimenti tratta le dissonanze più o meno secondo le attese. Quando ci si confronta con le anomalie di una composizione, allora, bisogna considerare tre questioni. L'anomalia compare nelle fonti più autorevoli di quel pezzo, Supponendo di sì, quanto è anomalo e quante altre anomalie troviamo? Se il pezzo è nel corpus sicuro e se l'anomalia sembra, sembra risalire all'archetipo, allora dobbiamo ovviamente accettare il passaggio qualunque cosa accada. Se invece l'evidenza della fonte è equivoca o debole, dobbiamo valutare il passaggio nel contesto del corpus sicuro. Per le restanti opere, Un'anomalia dovrebbe indurre alla ricerca di, di ulteriori esempi che insieme possano aiutarci a determinare se le ragioni per accettare l'opera restano valide ad un esame approfondito. I giudizi di attribuzione sono sempre il prodotto di valutazioni di merito, ma come vedremo i criteri sono spessi, spesso chiari al punto che questo metodo ha permesso a Rifkin e a me di assegnare tutti i 345 pezzi a una delle quattro categorie. Sicura, attribuibile provvisoriamente, problematica e spuria. Dopo aver delineato questi principi, vorrei ora descrivere una situazione che si è verificata mentre io e Rifkin stavamo finalizzando la nostra lista delle opere per il contributo su Early Music. La creazione di questa lista ci ha dato l'opportunità di tornare... No, sì, eh. tutto a posto, tutto a posto. Sì, sì. No. La creazione di questa lista ci ha dato l'opportunità di tornare su pezzi che non avevamo studiato da vicino da tempo 
e di riflettere su questioni di paternità a proposito di pezzi che non avevamo recentemente considerato da quella prospettiva. Il termine recentemente è importante, va sottolineato che la nostra capacità di soppesare i punti più fini della pratica contrapuntistica di Josquin, il suo trattamento della dissonanza in particolare, è stato messo a fuoco sempre più chiaramente negli ultimi due decenni. Ora abbiamo una comprensione molto migliore di ciò che accade nel corpus sicuro e di ciò che non accade. Questo è il motivo per cui è così utile tornare più e più volte sulla stessa composizione. Ad ogni nuovo passaggio scopriamo qualcosa in più. Una domenica pomeriggio di marzo ricevo un'email da Joshua che mi chiede dall'amatissimo mottetto a sei voci o Virgo Virginum un brano che abbiamo provvisoriamente assegnato alla categoria 2, provvisoriamente attribuibile. Scrive Joshua, portiamolo a 3, eh, se non addirittura a 4. Incuriosito, torno alla partitura. Leggo il pezzo nella New Joskin Edition, ma poi, per risparmiare il te tempo, lo recupero sul sito web di Joskin Research Project. Ecco il sito. Ecco la partitura nostra. In particolare l'ho valutato utilizzando lo strumento Parallel, ecco il work page, ecco, per la, vedere la partitura, fare le analisi, ecco Parallel. Più tardi, quel pomeriggio, rispondo a Joshua con un'osservazione sulle ottave e quinte parallele. Ecco un esempio in verde, non so se vedete, ottave. Ah, sì. Ci sono cinque casi di parallelismi, non un numero che esclude automaticamente il pezzo, ma sicuramente qualcosa che fa alzare le sopracciglia, in particolare questo passaggio. Il mio passo successivo è quello di leggere il pezzo utilizzando lo strumento dissonant di Joskin Research Project, che evidenza e classifica ogni nota dissonante in un, in un determinato lavoro. Ecco, ogni dissonanza è colorata. Valutando queste dissonanze rispetto alla mia conoscenza del corpus sicuro, scopro una manciata di casi strani, inclusa una coppia di settime successive che coincide con una delle quinte parallele. Ecco. La questione qui non è se queste dissonanze o parallelismi siano censurabili o meno. La questione è se siano o no caratteristici di Josquin. Questo brano è composto per sei voci e come tale deve sicuramente datare dopo il 1500. Come tale il suo contesto nell'opera di Josquin è chiaro. Soprattutto mottetti a sei voci con solide attribuzioni come Benedicta S, Preterum Seriem o Virgo Prudentissima e Pater Noster, insieme a un gruppo di, can di sei canzoni a sei voci. A questi pezzi si potrebbero aggiungere i brani a quattro e cinque voci degli ultimi due decenni della vita di Josquin. Abbiamo così un ben nutrito corpus di opere sicure da usare come base di riferimento per giudic giudicare questo esempio particolare. Esaminando questa porzione del corpus sicuro ci imbattiamo nell'occasionale parallelismo proibito sebbene esempi così eclatanti come quelli che ho mostrato un momento fa compaiono raramente. E troviamo un approccio al trattamento della dissonanza che è, con poche eccezioni, straordinariamente coerente e straordinariamente attento. Dopo molte altre email sull'argomento, Joshua crea una lista di anomalie, elencando dissonanze e parallelismi attestate in più fonti. Ci sono inoltre altre due fattori, da, fattori da considerare. La prima è che i sicuri mottetti a sei voci si dividono in due chiare categorie. Sì. Due categorie. 
brani in cui due voci sono regolate da canoni rigor rigorosi, ovvero prudentissima e paternoster, e brani basati su un quasi canone tra superius e tenore, preterum e ovvero prudentissima. Questo motetto, il nostro, è più vicino a questa seconda categoria, ma il suo approccio al materiale preesistente si rivela oltre oltremodo sconnesso. Come si vede della tavola, l'antifona viene intonata in imitazione prima dal tenore al dal superius, poi dal superius al dal primo altus, poi dal superius al e dal tenore, poi dal superius e dal secondo altus, poi dal solo superius e infine dal tenore e dal superius. Manca la consueta coerenza di Josquin nel pianificare le composizioni. Ancora un altro problema riguarda l'esorio del motetto. Ostoff è stato il primo a notare una stretta relazione tra il nostro motetto problematico e il famoso preterrerum seriem. Come noto, preterrerum inizia con un denso episodio in stretto imitativo nelle voci più basse, seguito da una ripetizione più densa dello stesso materiale all'ottava superiore. O Virgo Virginum fa lo stesso. Ascoltiamo entrambe le aperture. No. No.
non per il lavoro artistico, ma se vogliamo fare delle cose di fatto, questa cosa qui ci dice che le cose che si scoprono sono quelle che sono possibili e che sono fattibili da vivere e da vedere. Se posso avere un follow up question. Certo. Um, David Fellows, se posso citarlo qui, è ancora convinto che Miller e Gray sia attribuito da Einstein sulla base della della qualità del brano, nonostante la situazione delle fonti eh, suggerisca diversamente. Sì, sì, sì. Eh, quindi eh, c'è un, 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 um, un, un livello in cui a un certo punto il giudizio artistico può, del, del calibro artistico di una composizione può non allinearsi con eh, mm. eh, la situazione delle fonti. Oppure... Eh, mm. Cioè, um, no, è una buonissima domanda. Sì. How do you say it sounds like Jessica? It, 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 it sounds... How do you say that? Like it, it, it sounds like Jessica. Suona, suona, suona come, suona come. Suona sì. Come. Allora, cominciato dalla fine, che io ho provato a avere un senso quasi interno dello stile di Josquin, vuol dire cominciando dai, dal corpo sicuro. E quando guardo un, un, un brano uh, incerto, mm -hmm. Uh, cerco le cose che non accordano con, con ciò che, che so di Josquin. Allora, in quel senso è davvero, sì, è qualcosa che si sente, non so, ma poi si deve fare, si deve descrivere, ma esattamente mm -hmm. perché, cosa ho trovato, cosa anche se il processo di scoprirlo è, non è logico dall'inizio. Ma parliamo di Miller Gray. È interessante perché Miller Gray è una è bellissima canzone, quella non è la domanda, non importa, è bellissima e non è di Josquin, va bene perché non possiamo avere, avere tutte queste due cose, ma suona come Josquin, quella è interessante, è molto simile alle canzoni tardive, a 5 e 6 voci ad esempio, molto simile, ma quando si comincia a guardare ciò che succede dal punto di vista contrapuntistico, e non è la stessa cosa, e tutti i motivi senza la complessità, senza mettere i motivi insieme in una maniera molto particolare, senza il, un canone Allora si vede qualcuno che ha, che ha che ha imparato internalized. a scrivere con, sì, co, sì, sì. come Jean Scan così bene che suona come Jean Scan. Suona come, ma non è. Non, eh. non, è allora, infine, non ha imparato a scrivere come Jean Scan, ma, ma ha cantato molto. Allora, sì. trova i motivi, sono le melodie simili, ma non ha nessuna idea come comporre come Jean Scan. Allora, cosa come... Credo che quello che sto chiedendo è, sulla base della, della vostra metodologia, ehm, è possibile ottenere canoni diversi pur rispettando la metodologia. Certo, è, okay. è per quello... E questo è, forse è un caso di questo... Certo, è, è per quello che abbiamo una categoria problematica, contiene mm -hmm. circa 35 brani, mm -hmm. perché i, i fonti sono, diciamo, dagli anni 1520, 30, non, non 1570, okay, che mm -hmm. come, no, 40, 50 che troviamo spesso. Allora, casi così, ma anche pezzi che, sembra, sembra, sembrava, eh, che, che, che sono simili a, a, ai mottetti sicuri, ad esempio, canzoni sicure, ma che ma, ma quando l'evidenza, dal punto di vista delle fonti, non è molto forte. Non è molto non forte, è molto, forte eh, certo, certo. In questi casi dobbiamo essere di, eh, aperti, aperti a, a cambiare a... idea, anche nella seconda categoria, devo dire. La, la prima categoria è non ci sono molto scolpita dubbi, nella pietra, più sì. o meno, no? non, non c'è... E il meglio che possiamo fare, infatti, ciò che devo dire, non è assoluta, ma è il meglio che possiamo fare. Ma la seconda categoria contiene qualche brano che è non difficile. Ad esempio, un mottetto che troviamo solo da un, da un spato di Petrucci, diciamo 1505, solo qua, attribuito a Giosquè. Allora, non, è, non cominciamo ad un... Attribuzione molto forte, molto importante. Petrucci sbaglia, soprattutto dopo 1505, ma sbaglia dall'inizio. Allora, ma se la musica è molto simile alla categoria più sicura, possiamo dire che provvisoriamente possiamo accettare. Accettare, certo, sì, certo. sì.
Ci sono altre domande dal, dal pubblico? Sì, Filippo. Mille regrets, ovvero un altro mottetto, accetterà che non sia il suo nome che si trovi su, su una fonte e che quando tu hai questo talento tu ti va a vendere per te stesso, non per il nome di Josquin. Josquin è un nome certo, ma non è un nome che... che o, o si aveva una dimensione commerciale a un livello pazzesco, si potrebbe capire, ma non, non è Britney Spears, della quale abbiamo parlato tutto il pranzo. Mm. È, è, è un altro caso, un altro modello. E è questo, questo che non capisco, uno che ha il talento, e abbiamo visto che i compositori sono molto rigorosi sulla la ricognizione del loro talento, uno che ha il talento perché lascia andare su opera? No, è una, è una buona domanda, è difficile. Allora, con Joscan troviamo un sacco di problemi, di problemi delle attribuzioni, cominciando da persone che sbagliano, che scrivono il nome sbagliato. Eh, che, che, allora, quello è, normale, questo è normale, ma è vero che cominciando più o meno dal 1505-10 troviamo questi casi strani, no, un, un pezzo che non sembra giusto è attribuito a Josquin. Allora, a un certo punto quel problema, della, eh, problema economica viene in considerazione, ma prima della sua morte non sono convinto che è già uh, molto uh, importante. All'inizio penso che dovrebbe essere un... Uh, è come un, un modo di fare... Uh, to, to make yourself seem... seem uh, to, to make yourself seem fame, to acquire fame, actually. Per acquistare eh, per, sì, fama, acquistare per... fame. Un, un, un modo di... sì, io ho scritto un pezzo e, e l'ho fatto, fatto entrare in modo come se fosse dice, è strano, è strano, ma, ma qualcosa del genere. Ah, okay, dobbiamo anche ricordare che sono diversi casi, che non è, sono, sono tutte le stesse. E, e al solito non possiamo decidere cosa è successo esattamente in quel caso. O Virgo Virginum, dobbiamo ricordare che all'inizio è anonimo. Sono molto più tardi, allora, 1530 è una storia completamente diversa. È già Josquin. È, 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 penso davvero in quel caso che qualcuno semplicemente ha sbagliato. Ha sbagliato. Ma quando troviamo, ad esempio, la messa di Dadi, che è strana, ma bellissima, ma non di Josquin, penso. Anni fa ho pensato di sì, adesso ho capito che no. Ma qualcuno che... Pro, che, che ama Josquin, che vuole fare una messa del genere e magari anche vuole che il nome di Josquin sia attaccato al pezzo, magari qualcosa del genere, o qualcun altro. Grazie. Camilla, sì. sì, sì. Camilla. Infinite per questa bellissima presentazione e attendiamo quindi con ansia di leggere l'articolo su Early Music. E, e poi grazie per questo lavoro così, così fondamentale, importante su tutta la produzione eh, di questo compositore che tutti abbiamo un po' paura. Eh, è vero, <ride> per chi non è proprio esperto, esperto appunto come, come te eh, sai esserlo. E, tra le motivazioni, mi chiedevo anche, sappiamo che attorno a Gioscani, in queste, eh, tra, tra so, Ferrari, i posti in cui è stato Ferrara, la corte del Papa, comunque si crea un gruppo di cantori compagnon, che sono amici, che si scrivono delle lettere, che si divertono a fare voci sopra. Eh, potrebbe, mi chiedevo se anche... Questa, come dire, questa realtà musicale di musicisti che sono originari eh, della, delle stesse terre, che si sono formati negli stessi ambiti, che hanno un'ammirazione particolare eh, per Josquin, per Roque Gem, eh, che non siano ecco, anche i possibili autori di, o, o che sia ecco, l'humus, il terreno in cui probabilmente questo, uh, questa attività, questo tipo di creazione musicale si uh, realizza. Cosa ne pensi? Non so, un'idea no, no, così no. che mi è venuta. <ride> no, grazie, è una, è una bella idea. Sì, ad esempio, uh, la sesta voce di Il Miserere di Bidon, 
Well, allora, magari ha composto qualche altro pezzo che a un certo punto erano attribuiti a, a Josquin. Abbiamo lo stesso, il stesso problema con Hook Messi de Reo, che è un, è un motetto a cinque voci, è, ma esiste un sesta, una sesta voce. Allora, in questi casi vediamo che magari qualcuno prova di comporre nel suo stile o di aggiungere qualcosa. Potrebbe essere la stessa persona. Sì. Grazie. Sì, ci sono... Sì. Uh, Lorenzo Donati. Riguardo proprio a questo, pensavo... Um, se non è possibile pensare che in... Um, come accadeva per la pittura, ci fosse una bottega, questi amici, questi compagni che cantavano la stessa musica e che magari decidevano di concludere, completare. Io mi capita adesso di insegnare composizione e alcuni miei allievi si avvicinano abbastanza a quello che scrivo perché eh, tendono a magari a avvicinarsi a quello che è il loro insegnante, a volte correggi anche qualcosa e, e glieli ritocchi, magari mm. oggi ognuno ha bisogno di scrivere il proprio nome, all'epoca forse eh, era bene scrivere quello del maestro, sappiamo che in ambito pittorico spesso eh, abbiamo uh, la parte principale fatta dal grande pittore, ma il resto è fatto dalla bottega. Mi chiedo se alcune di queste discrepanze non dipendono dal fatto che magari in alcuni casi, come accadrà poi anche con Bach, eh, non ci sia una continuità di una scuola che poi porta lo stesso nome, ma eh, fosse un po' un laboratorio, come in Italia ce n'erano molti di botteghe di questo tipo in ambito pittorico. Questa è una domanda, se mi permette, è una sì. domanda molto interessante. Se, se Murray Stibe, Murray, are you there? Because I know that you have worked on this particular aspect of uh, collaborative composition in the... Una buona domanda. Sì, sì. Ne abbiamo parlato... Molto. I'm not sure that Murray is listening, no, no. but um, uh, uh, I'm listening. Um, what, what was the question again? Uh, if there are instances of uh, collaborative composition in at this time, uh, so that there's evidence that different composers, maybe composers and their, their students or, or colleagues have uh, uh, collaborated, have worked together to uh, finish a mass or say maybe they would write different movements of a mass or 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 something like that i i seem to remember that you wrote, yeah. wrote something right i did um what i have found is that i haven't found any examples of people actually working together what i have found examples of is one person uh updating or working on something that has already been written by somebody else. Uh -huh. So kind of editorial, so yes. kind of editing. Quindi c'è yes. quello che dice il collega Murray, dice c'è un esempio di uh, revisioni, uh, revisioni compositive fatte da altri. Infatti Johannes Martini in Ferrara did just that, right? Uh, sì. Cioè, sì. È, è un tema molto interessante che sicuramente merita ulteriori studi, grazie. C'era una domanda di, da Marcello, poi... Ah, scusa, eh... c'era una domanda su, su, da, dall'ultima... Ah. Grazie. Grazie mille, Jesse, per questa presentazione. Eh, io volevo dire solo mh, una cosa. Eh, trovo molto affascinante questa questione delle, delle attribuzioni, sicuramente, e come dire, perché ragionando con un'estetica del ventunesimo secolo. Noi, noi abbiamo sempre questo tentativo di voler attribuire qualcosa a un compositore importante, perché per noi l'idea anche un po' romantica no, del compositore eh, che ci affascina no, per tutta la vita, noi dobbiamo trovare assolutamente questo brano. Però ragionando un po' in termini antichi, tra virgolette, no? eh, che noi vediamo che c'è tantissima appunto musica non attribuita no? e vediamo per esempio uno come un contemporaneo eh, di Josquin, per esempio Teofilo Folengo, no? che ci dice che il contrappunto in realtà la cosa più importante che apprezzavano all'epoca era il contrappunto, non l'autorialità. Addirittura ci dice in questo, eh, in questo parte del Baldus eh, si parla appunto di un cantore che improvvisa una messa e dice la è così bello il fatto che la improvvisi che se ci fosse qui Gioschino imparerebbe a comporre una messa. Ah, è, è, è chiaramente una provocazione la mia, no? Ma è per dire, non è che forse tutto questo, questo bellissimo progetto 
anziché arrivare a un aspetto di attribuzionismo, forse ci, ci può insegnare maggiormente l'aspetto del contrappunto, che è questa la cosa veramente notevole di cui noi abbiamo bisogno, trovare le forme del contrappunto anziché trovare le forme dell'autorialità. Scusami, è chiaramente una, una provocazione. Un po' difficile qui. No, no, buona domanda. Allora, devo dire che nel corso del 400 il concetto dell'autorità diventa più, di più in più importante. Cominciamo da, da, da quel punto, come ha scritto Perkins e Strome e altri. Eh, Josquin, allora, è un, comp un compositore che fa le cose diverse, ma c'è un, una stampa, diciamo. Cioè, sono, allora, tutti imparano da una punta di vista contrappuntistica co cosa si può fare e cosa non si può più o meno sono d'accordo più o meno cosa si può fare ma è un gruppo piccolo penso che, che possono fare questo all'improvviso e poi uh, scrivere come, come, esatto, come race fact esattamente ma quando cominciamo, cominciamo a analizzare i pezzi da Brumel, di Josquin, di Isaac, emergono, emergono di, differenze importanti. Non è che il sesto, ottava, okay, la stessa cosa, no, troviamo le cose che, ok, questo dovrebbe essere lui e questo dovrebbe essere lui, eh, che, che emerge un'idea un del, del stile personale. E questo che è, 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 ho lavorato su quel tema molto perché è difficile parlare de, di, un, di uno stile personale in 400, 500 e penso che a un certo punto evitiamo quell'idea perché è troppo difficile accetterla. È più facile dire ma non c'è. Non c'è solo l'idea di sesto, ottavo, ok, va bene, impariamo come fare all'improvviso. No, ma infatti no, c'è questo e poi sopra di questo c'è... Le melodie che scrive, scrivono Josquin, nessun altro co compone così, comp così. non, non c'è. Magari a un certo punto copiano, ma, ma lui crea qualcosa uh, unica. E poi fa la stessa cosa Marpriano Steorto. Non è che Josquin è l'unica, no, ma potremmo fare questo per tutti i compositori del, della sua generazione, è solo che il problema è molto più importante <ride> uh, rispetto a Josquin. Grazie Jesse, penso che dobbiamo chiudere qui, magari ci sarà modo di continuare questa conversazione anche eh, in privato. Vorrei ora passare al secondo relatore del giorno, eh, il mio amico e collega Murray Stibe, professore e direttore del Dipartimento di Musicologia a Ball State University in Indiana. Ha conseguito il PhD all'Università di Chicago nel 92 e ha pubblicato numerosi studi nelle maggiori riviste specializzate soprattutto su musica sacra e sul tema dei prestiti e citazioni musicali nel Rinascimento. Ha pubblicato l'edizione della musica sacra di Johannes Martini e Johannes Brebis e un'edizione delle messe di Firminus Caron, che è appena uscita. Sta preparando un'edizione di Vicente Lusitano e una biografia di Johannes Martini. Mary Stibe is Professor of Music History and Chair of the Department of Musicology at Ball State University, He earned his PhD at Chicago in 92 with Howard Meyer Brown. He has published widely, particularly in the areas of sacred music of the 15th and early 16th centuries and musical borrowings in the Renaissance, including uh, he has produced editions of Johannes Martini, Johannes Brebis and Firminus Caron, and is currently working on uh, editions of Lusitano and the biography of Martini. Uh, uh, Murray, Professor Stipe's paper is Uh, the Sacred Vocal Origins of Johannes Martini's Instrumental Music. Let us welcome Professor Murray Stibe. Thank you for being with us, Murray. Thank you. Uh, you, can, you can start. Uh, well, actually, I'm trying to share screen. Oh. Um, and uh, I am having trouble. 
Um, yeah. Disability. Uh, I'm, I'm... Dice che non riesce a, a mostrare le immagini. I'm sorry. Just a second. It seems uh, it seems that we are fine on this at this end. Can you see my screen? No, we see you. Oh, yeah. Well, I need to share screen. Otherwise, uh, this is not going to make a whole lot of sense. Um, hmm. That's strange. I'm trying to. Um, PowerPoint. I just want to share my PowerPoints. Um, so what happens when you press share screen? Ah. Uh, do you see? Do you do you see, Marie? The uh, is it blue? A blue tab uh, at, the, at the bottom. It's green tab. It's a green tab. Share screen. I click on it. I click on share. Uh, well, let me try this. It keeps asking me to open my system preferences. And, but I don't know what I'm supposed to click on here. Is, is your file open? Is your PowerPoint file open? Of course it is. Yes, it is. And it's on the desktop. You might need to go to system preferences and Turn some turn sharing on if it's somehow off. If it's asking you that, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, okay. Open system preferences. Um, screen. Share right. I mean, the other thing you could try is simply sharing your whole screen, if you don't mind, and then not at all. But um, Apple. Ah, sì, ci abbiamo, ci abbiamo. Sì, 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 sì. In Dropbox, perché non apriamo qua? We, we, could, we could operate it from here if we, uh, if we download the file that you sent us. Uh, well, that's, that won't have the music on it. Um, I can send you, it'll take a minute or two, but I can try to send you my, uh, my PowerPoints. Do we have the PowerPoint? Yeah, he's uploaded. Yeah. I think he sent us the. I fa rientrare. The uh, rebooting. Okay. Uh, the suggestion is for you to log out and reconnect. Okay, I will try that. Thank, I hope thanks, we'll see thank you. Thank you. In a few minutes. Uh, leave me. That's a good idea. Uh, maybe we could. Claire, would you like to go now? So to say in the interest of time, we could hear Claire's paper now and Murray's, if we work this out, is that okay? I'm just your friendly German. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's work this out. So, uh, thank you. So we're, we're moving on with uh, Claire Bokulic instead as we sort things out with Murray. Okay, can you see me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, let me try to share screen again. Um, it keeps telling me to open the system preferences. Um, yes. I think we should ask me to ask questions. Well, I, 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 I would, that's why they asked me to okay. do this today. Okay. Uh, Mary, uh, if, yeah. if you don't mind, we're going to move on with Claire's paper now. In the meantime, okay. you, you can sort things out with you. And so you will go after her if you don't mind. That's In the interest fine. of time. Do you want me to send you my PowerPoint? Uh, that might be helpful. Thank you. Okay. I will mute. Thank you. Claire Bokulic, 
ha ottenuto il PhD in musicologia a Stanford University con una dissertazione sul tema dei generi vocali nel Rinascimento. Ha insegnato per alcuni anni a Washington University a St. Louis e dallo scorso autunno è affiliata alla University of Zurich per conseguire la habilitazione. Ha pubblicato studi su Jean Scan nel journal Musicology, Early Music History e nel volume Motet Cycles Between Devotion and Liturgy, edito da Daniele Filippi e Agnese Pavanello. Il suo studio Contextualizing Jean Scan's Ave Maria Virgo Serena ha ricevuto il premio Roland Jackson della American Musicological Society, ha anche ricevuto borse di studio dalla Whiting and Lieberman Foundations. Il suo contributo di oggi è parte di un nuovo progetto sulla lunga storia della messa polifonica. Claire Bokulic received her PhD in musicology at Stanford with a dissertation on issues of genre in the Renaissance. Her writing on Josquin appears in the journal Musicology, Early Music History, and a volume published by Daniele Filippi and Daniele Agnese Pavanello. Her presentation today draws from a new project on the long history of the polyphonic mass. Uh, the title of uh, Claire's paper is Jean Scan and the Two Voice Three Part Benedictus. Let us welcome Claire Bokulic. Thank you for being with us. Following a lengthy four-voice osana marked with frequent meter changes and a rich full-voice texture, the Benedictus of Josquin's Misa Malheur Me Ba changes gears entirely, presenting a series of three self-contained duos. The first set to the single word Benedictus, the second to Qui Venit, and the last to In Nomine Domini. The top voice of each duo presents the opening 10 measures of the Mass's antecedent song, Malheur Me Ba, at three different pitch levels, E, D, and A, while the lower voice presents new material in each duo. Let's take a listen. of expansiveness, or dare I say, maximalism, then the Benedictus can be characterized by the opposite, an aesthetic of modesty. With a drastically reduced texture, the Benedictus issues canon and other compositional complexities, and is among the very shortest self-contained sections in Josquin's entire compositional output. Its compositional unity notwithstanding, the cyclic mass is also remarkably heterogeneous in terms of vocal texture, length, and form. While it's tempting to focus on the more expansive mo movements featuring greater technical wizardry, I will demonstrate today that the smallest, briefest sections of the mass are equally worthy of our attention. Admittedly, reduced texture sections have not exactly been a hot topic in the literature. In his treatise from 1613, Pietro Cerone wrote the following, the composer is at liberty to write the Christe, Crucifixus, Pleni, Benedictus, and the second Agnus for fewer voices than are used in the work as a whole. In other words, if the mass 
is for five voices, the aforesaid sections may be written for three or even two. Beyond this pithy description, there is, to my knowledge, no other historical writing on the practice of reduced texture sections, nor is there much in the way of contemporary writing on the topic either. In New Grove, reduced texture sections are mentioned only briefly, where they're described rather puzzlingly as interludes, a designation that seems to suggest they're distinct from the main act. But reduced texture sections are by no means incidental, for not only is each section of the mass text integral to the liturgy, but the Benedictus, whether set for reduced textures or not, often accompanies the elevation of the host, which could hardly be construed as an interlude. The convention of setting certain sections of the mass in reduced textures is possibly as old as the polyphonic mass itself. And yet, as we will see, it also changed subtly, but nonetheless significantly over time. The earliest three voice English masses present a consistent picture of reduced texture sections with the Plainy, Benedictus, and Agnus II all written for two voices. Similarly, early English Sanctus Agnus pairs from the 1430s by the likes of Bennett and Power reveal the same concentration of two voice writing in the Plainy, Benedictus, and Agnus II. By contrast, the Gloria and Credo, including both independent movements and those in early cycles, do contain reduced texture sections, but they are much more sporadic and far less uniform. There's almost no consistency with respect to which sections of these lengthy movements are isolated in this way. As Andrew Kirkman has argued, Sanctus Agnus pairs may have served as an incubation chamber for musical linking across the five movements. Thus, it seems likely that the practice of reducing certain sections began in the Sanctus and Agnus before spreading to other movements of the mass. As we tread farther into the 15th century, the number of masses grows exponentially. I've gathered data from over 1,000 settings of the mass from the 15th and 16th centuries, noting among other things, which portions of the mass are set in self-contained reduced textures. The following heat map reflects these data. Here, individual composers are on the Y axis and sections of the mass are on the X. Frequency is mapped on a continuum of blue to red, the darkest red indicating that the composer sets that particular section of the mass in a reduced texture 100% of the time. In contrast, if the composer never sets a particular portion of the mass in a reduced texture section, it appears as dark blue. If the composer sets a particular section in a reduced texture approximately 50% of the time, then it'll appear on the heat map as green. These data can also be arranged according to similarity. With this computational technique, composers are clustered together based on how similar their approach to reduced texture mass sections is. It's important to bear in mind that the, that the computer knows nothing about these composers' biographies. It only knows the data concerning reduced textures. What's really interesting here is that we can observe a clear division that falls more or less between the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, and you can see in the, the, that's divided by the top part. Um, and the lower half is the 15th and, and the family relationships, kind of how similar they are to one another is represented on the left with the branches. We can also see that there's a lot more variation in the 15th century compared to the 16th, when the convention of setting certain sections in a reduced texture becomes more consistent. The discrepancy in the 15th century is particularly telling, as it suggests that the convention may be a meaningful site of compositional agency. In other words, reduced texture sections may reflect a kind of signature or fingerprint that can help enrich our understanding of individual composers. To take just a few examples, we can see right away that Obrecht is much more consistent in setting the Plainy and, and Benedictus in a reduced texture than Dufay or Ockeghem was. But looking a little farther into the 16th century, Gombert is even more consistent in the Plainy and Benedictus than Obrecht. 
There are other idiosyncrasies that we can observe from the map too that we might not have noticed otherwise. For example, the Gaspar von Weyerbrecke set the et incarnatus est in a reduced texture more than his contemporaries did. And that Bunuel was the first composer to consistently set the Christe in a reduced texture. It is Joscan, however, whose treatment of reduced texture sections really stands out, and for not just one, but three distinct reasons. The first distinguishing feature is that he uses both duos and trios in his reduced texture sections. For example, a three-voice Plainy and a two-voice Benedictus, whereas his contemporaries almost exclusively use trios. Interestingly, this diversity of reduced texture scoring becomes the norm in the 16th century, but it's rare in the 15th. Another noticeable distinction, notable distinction is that Josquin never sets the Christe for reduced textures. Again, this sets him clearly apart from his contemporaries like Obrecht and Isaac who usually do. It's in the Benedictus, however, where Josquin creates the most distance from his contemporaries in that he tends to break apart the Benedictus into three discrete duos, each set in an independent section as we heard in the Misa Maler Meba. The division of the Benedictus into three discrete sections is particularly fascinating, not least because it means a single word, Benedictus, consisting of just four syllables receives its own discrete section. When we consider the different approaches to text in the mass, such as the syllabic setting of the lengthy credo text, the self-contained Benedictus is at the complete opposite end of the spectrum, basking in just a single word. Of Joscan's 14 most secure mass cycles, 11 present a reduced texture Benedictus, of which seven break the Benedictus into three discrete sections. In all seven, Joscan breaks the Benedictus into three duos, never trios, and there is usually some degree of resemblance between the three sections. This resemblance takes different shapes. Sometimes it's literal, as in the Misa Lomarme Sextitoni, where the two voice Benedictus is repeated verbatim in the in nomine. The quivenit is exactly the same length, but it doesn't appear to have any shared material. In the Misa Lami Bodichon, the Misa Hercules Dux Ferrarie, and the Misa Malerme Ba, as we've already heard, one voice of the Benedictus duo is repeated in the quivenit and in nomine. In Lami Bodichon, the music of the altus stays the same in the Benedictus, quivenit, and in nomine, while the accompanying voice changes from superius to bassus back to superius. I'm gonna go through the examples first and then we're gonna go back and listen to them. And in Hercules, the repeated material, which is the soggetto cavato for the entire mass stays in the tenor, while the accompanying voice switches from altus to basus to superius. And as we already heard in the Misa Malerme Ba, which is a segmentation mass, the first segment is repeated at three different pitch levels, E, D, and A. In both the Misa Lomarme Super Vocis Musicales and Misa Sini Nomine, the resemblance is at the level of compositional technique. In Super Vocis Musicales, the Benedictus, Quivenit, and in Nomine each feature a mensuration canon at the unison. And in Sine Nomine, a mensuration canon forms the Benedictus. The single notated melody for the Benedictus becomes the lower voice of the Quivenit and the upper voice of the In, nom in Nomine. And now we will listen. Thank you. 
subsections of the Benedictus surely reflects a level of formal thinking. That this occurs in the Benedictus, the section sandwiched between the Ozana, which itself is almost always performed under a verbatim ut supra repeat, is certainly conspicuous. Another conspicuous feature of the Benedictus is that they all shun not only imitative openings, but imitation in general. Their lack of imitation is salient, particularly in light of the fact that reduced texture sections have been described as the fonds et origo of pervasive imitation. Richard Truskin, for instance, writes that such, such sections were, quote, epoch makers. Out of earlier techniques of canon and voice exchange, the composer has worked out a manner of writing that replaces the cantus firmus with a series of points of imitation. Beginning with, the style, beginning with the generation of Obrecht, every composer of masses and motets practiced the pervading imitation style. They all learned it directly or indirectly from Bunuel." end quote. And for Julie Cumming, the imitative quality of reduced text or sections is crucial to her theorization of imitation and Tictoris's threefold genre hierarchy. Indeed, many of Joskin's other reduced texture sections, including those in two voices as well as three, are bristling with imitative counterpoint. It's only the two voice, three part Benedictuses that forego imitation. 
Though there may be different reasons for this, their brief length seems the most likely as most of the tripartite Benedictuses fall within a span of just nine to 10 briefs. As this allows very little space to work out the implications of an imitative gambit, the simultaneous opening may reveal the demands of imitation on duration. So if they aren't imitative, what are they? What compositional techniques or features characterize Jostgen's tripartite Benedictus duos? Generally speaking, they're marked by rhythmic variety. In each duo, there are almost no two measures that feature the same rhythmic profile. And they're also very busy. Neither voice rests for more than a semi brief at a time. There are no slowly moving block chords, no meter changes or sesquialtera. Beyond these basic commonalities, Josquin's Benedictus duos feature a rather impressive range of techniques. Particularly interesting are the different tools he uses to build momentum under such restrained circumstances. To take just two examples, the qui venit of the Misa La Marme Sextitoni is built almost entirely from stepwise motion. Each altus phrase begins with an FG turning figure and ends with an increasingly large melodic leap. First a major third, then a perfect fourth, and then a perfect fifth in the final measure. In just nine briefs, Joscan systematically prepares the melodic high point, the C in the penultimate measure, by climbing one note farther in each phrase and simultaneously quickening the pacing. Let's hear that. In the Quivenit and in Nomine of the Hercules Mass, similar motives are used against the slowly moving Soggetto Cavato. In the Quivenit, the Basus's melody, framed by a falling minor third at the beginning and a falling fifth at the end, is repeated at a quicker pace against the same AG motion in the tenor. As the Soggetto Cavato moves from A to C in the next two briefs, the Basus phrase remains circumscribed by the same parameters, falling minor third, falling perfect fifth. Here it is. The in nomine under operates under similar parameters against the Sagento Cavato in the tenor, the superius is framed this time by an ascending half step and falling fifth. As in, as in the Quivenit, the same phrase is repeated at a quicker pace in the following two measures. And again, as in the Quivenit, the following phrase begins with the same half-step motion in the superior, but continues rather surprisingly, not with a falling fifth like all previous phrases, but a scaling octave leap that is luxuriously held across the bar line, seemingly in defiance of the falling motion that would otherwise define the Quivenit and in nomine. These are but a few of the techniques Zoskin uses to shape his two voice, three part type, three part Benedictuses. A section of the mass which, in spite of its comparatively minuscule proportions, is every bit as integral to the mass as it is to our understanding of Josquin's compositional language. Thank you so much, Claire, for this. Fascinating paper. This seems a very promising line of research. And as you say, it, it hasn't been pursued with the dedication and the care that it deserves. Um, I don't know if there are any questions from the audience. One question I have in mind is, so is it the case that 
there are really no historical trends here that you can think is really most what the composers, single composers want to do. It's not that there is a, a, pad, a historical pattern so that say uh, up until a particular time, this is what happens and... Um, no, uh, can I share my screen again? Um, so I think in the 15th century, yes, you're right. Um, that it's more or less composer to composer. And that's why I think it can be kind of useful um, in, if we think about it in terms of a kind of a compositional fingerprint um, or signature. Um, but as we move into the 16th century, which um, I'm so sorry that it's so small on the screen, that's represented in the, the top of um, the graph, things mm -hmm. become a lot more consistent Mm -hmm. um, in terms of which sections composers set. And you can tell that, for instance, the, um, the, the, I can't point to it, but the dark red, which actually looks darker red on my screen, but um, the dark red means 100% of the time the composer sets that section in a reduced texture. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, this is happening at the same time that composers are experimenting with expanding the texture in other movements oh, of the mass. Oh, I see. So I think it's kind of interesting that reduced textures get more codified in the 16th and um, the kind of experimentation happens with expanding the textures in other sections. Thank you. Uh, is there any sense that obviously these sections would have been sung by perhaps the best singers in the, uh, in the chapel? Uh, is <gasps> I guess it's all pure speculation, yeah. right? You would, you would think that this would be an opportunity for the, for the best paid singers to show off and you maybe know, they would fight for it, right? Yeah, I, it's so tempting to think that. Um, I think we could also think about it in a completely opposite way. What if a composer was trying to kind of like out the singers and like make sure they were, you know, on top of their game uh -huh. and wanted to kind of expose them or I don't know, perhaps when we think about how expansive the third on you stay can be and how kind of, I would imagine for singers very um, demanding vocally, perhaps the Benedictus is a time to kind of um, rest your voice and kind of take a pause before that third, a third on final your on your stay, yeah. which will be kind of it's where kind, you, yeah. you throw everything you have. And... Exactly. Like taking a little cool down lap before the last final. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Domande dalla platea. Jesse. Thank you, Claire. This is great. And I think it, it should be you know, underscored how, as you said, how strange these are, how unusual these are, these duos. Um, two thoughts come to mind. One is, is related to what you were just talking about, that it does seem like there's a kind of virtuosity that they demand, right? Um, because they're so bare. And because they're at this moment where you've just sung often, you're about to sing the Ozana, or you've just sung the Ozana, and suddenly two, maybe two people have to, you know, yeah, really yeah. get it together get it together it's very exposed yeah. and at a scary point in the in the day because mm -hmm. you've done a lot already so that's interesting and the other point thought is again connects to what you've said which is that it's almost like he's found a totally different way to do what he always does yeah right because in the in so many of these cases where it's one melody that's basically repeated or transposed benedictus qui veni di nomine domini and then he works motives against that same melody in different ways. Mm -hmm. And that you find that already in La Mi Bodichon, which is presumably the earliest mass, is kind of amazing that already by that point, whenever that is, 1480, whatever, he's worked out that there's like a longer process that unfolds across this little tiny section that he's made littler still by breaking it up into parts. Mm -hmm. And then that fragmentation then makes the Ozana burst out more because it's, it's a bigger thing and these are so little and, and, and yeah, chopped. Kind yeah, of. I, I completely agree. And I do have to admit that when I was first looking at them more peripherally, I thought that 
that seems like it doesn't seem very much like Joskin. Like it doesn't, there doesn't seem to be a lot of motivicity, uh, inter interlocks, anything like that. And I realized after studying them more carefully that I think it's just in a, under a very different kind of circumstance. And um, I think I'm so used to looking at, you know, four, five, six voice textures for that kind of thing that it kind of just took a moment for my eyes to adjust or I don't know what, but yeah. I would say to comment on what you just said, that type of uh, sensibility for form, or as we might call it, uh, is quite fascinating. And you you would expect just that from a, from a from a prominent, obviously from an accomplished composer like on, Joskin. On the form question or idea, I have been wondering. It's a bit of a chicken and egg thing. Like, did Joskin decide kind of approximately how short they were going to be, and then? fill the space or the opposite because they are all very short and so it seems like he kind of had the length in mind before he decided what one parameter he was going to choose to kind of explore in yeah in many of them yeah I'd say from a constructivist like Jean Scan, you would expect that he plans ahead first, yeah. and then he decides what to do with it. But plans ahead, like, like, so he sets the amount of briefs that he's going right, to write, something like that. Yes, because it, following that suggestion that yeah. he wants to have the longer uh, uh, episode for mm. the, you know, to, to leave it for the later movement. So mm -hmm. he decides to compartmentalize this one mm -hmm. more, uh, you know, in more tiny particles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, other demande, other questions from? What, one more question. Anything about instruments? Is it possible that that these sections could have been performed because the, the priest would have recited the text anyway, right? Yeah, I imagine that um, Murray Stab might be talking might to about <laughs> this. That's true. us about this very topic. Um, I think certainly with the three voice Isaac sections, I think from my perspective, I think Isaac was probably writing them for the mass, but imagining their life five, 10 years down the line and was imagining them for instruments, even mm -hmm. though he's writing them for the mass. I don't think that's really the same for Joskin. Um, in fact, this maybe is a little bit crazy, but I wonder if by segmenting them, so uh, yeah, segmenting them so uh, so that they're so short is kind of a way of like preserving their place in the mass because I can't really imagine a, a tripartite duo like that circulating kind of independently, like just the quivenit or something like that. And yet, of course, the English tradition of the enomina is yeah. precisely maybe that example okay so maybe i take it back <laughs> I, I don't know it's I, I don't think there is a way to answer the, the, the but know. anyway i certainly agree like for the three voice particularly isaac obrecht um mass sections i think it absolutely makes sense to think of them um instrumentally but i just i don't see the joskin duos in the same kind of landscape mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. If there are no other questions, I think we uh, uh, move on to the next speaker. Thank you so much for your presentation, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we introduced Murray already. Uh, hi, Murray. Let's try again hi. to share the screen. Let's see if it works. Okay. Otherwise, I have your slides here. OK, great. Let me try. Can I, uh, connect. Uh, oh, wait. Um, why don't you why don't you try to share your screen? If not, I I just have to get what I want to share up. Okay, now it's up. Okay. Uh, uh, 
Advocate. Okay, it, uh, step no, it's not gonna work. It's still not working, okay. No. So I'm going to uh, show them from here. Okay, will I be able to see them? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, you, you should probably have your own slides on your machine. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Okay. Claudio. Do you, do you have any any audio? Yes, Two of them have embedded audio. Okay. Okay. I think I'm all connected. Okay. Um, Uh, oh, I can see them, yes. Okay, actually, hold on a second, because I need to, uh, um, <laughs> now, now, now everybody's seeing way too much here. Uh, I think I need to download this first. I forgot to download them. Okay. <laughs> Okay, presenters view, okay, here we go. Okay, uh, second slide. The next one, there we go. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Huh. Keith Polk recently pinpointed the beginning of a new instrumental style to the 1480s. This new style is based on fairly constant imitation in all voices, as well as a few other criteria that I will discuss shortly. He refers to this style using Helen Hewitt's term trichinia and suggests that it developed in Italy, particularly Florence, during the 1480s and evolved out of the chanson. He further elucidates a rather rapid evolution from early to mature trichinia that takes place during that same decade. Early trichinia are best represented by Martini and mature ones by Isaac. The chanson out of which these trichinia grew were for three voices in a form fix with a layered texture in which the cantus tenor duet was sometimes imitative, but the contra tenor was more accompanimental and only rarely used imitation. Finally, phrases tended to be long with episodic imitation rather than short with regular imitation. We all know this style from the chanson of Dufay, Akagam, Bunwa, and a host of others. The most prolific and paradigmatic composer of these early trichinia is Johannes Martini. He composed approximately 45 secular pieces, only two of which have anything approaching a full text in any of their sources, which suggests that they were conceived for instrumental performance or at the very least, that the scribes who copied them assumed that that is how they would be used. 32 of these pieces, nearly three quarters, are for three voices, and it is these trichinia that I would like to carefully explore today. To be sure, a few of his trichinia were composed before 1480, and although they must be considered instrumental piece, they do not represent the new style that became prominent in the 1480s. Next slide, please. The quintessential example of this is La Martinella, probably composed by the early 1460s and copied in the Trent 89 by 1465. This is a long piece. Next slide. Here is page two. This piece has a few features in common with the new Trichinia style. It is in three voices and there is a fair amount of imitation more than you would expect to see by Dufay, Akagim, or even Bunoir. Next slide, please. 
Here's the imitation on the first page. There are, however, significant differences in style between La Martinella and what we will see in the 1480s. Most notable are the lack of a clear vocal form, as much two-part writing as three-part, no imitation in all three voices, and a texture that is a cantus tenor duet with a contratenor that is still basically accompanimental. In this lengthy piece, for example, the contratenor participates in imitation only once, relatively briefly, and then only with the tenor, not the cantus. This is shown in blue on this slide. Polk's early, uh, next slide, please. Polk's early Tricinia style is exemplified by Martini's Toujours Mus Viendra, a later work that first appears in the 1480s. Although this piece has a few things in common with La Martinella, their differences are more numerous and important. Next slide. The, P, the work opens with a section in clear imitation in all three parts, marked off by a strong cadence. Notice that the imitation begins at the octave above and fifths below, in other words, on G, G, and C, and that the distance between entries varies, two and then three briefs. Also note that the imitation in the contratenor, the lowest voice, is shorter than in the other two voices, three and a half rather than five and a half briefs. A shorter entry in the contratenor occurs in about half of Martini's Trichinia when there is imitation in all three voices. Next slide. There's a cadence in measure eight before the tenor finished, uh, finishes the, its imitation. Next slide. After a strong medial cadence, slightly more than halfway through the piece, next slide, the secunda pars uh, also begins with a point of imitation in all three voices. This time the imitation is at the fifth above and the octave below, that is on C, G, and G, and the entry in the contratenor is again shorter than those in the contus and tenor, two and a half rather than three and a half briefs. In this particular imitation, the contus and tenor outline the central G to D fifth of the mode, which is common in many of Martini's Tricinia. In uh, both halves of the piece, Martini has more imitation after the initial point. These are usually shorter, sometimes no more than a brief motive, and can be in either three or only two voices. In this piece, the entries, uh, next slide, and I'm gonna be going through slides quickly now. Uh, in this piece, the entries are uh, fifths or octave apart. C and C here, next slide, G and C uh, in the first half, followed by, next slide, uh, G, D, and D, and then next slide, uh, D and G in the second half. In the second half of many of these early trichinia, usually very close to the final cadence, Martini often employs some sequencing. Next slide, please. Um, which this uh, sequencing, uh, which may occur in only a single voice or in all three as we see here. The last repetition is usually altered somehow. I've indicated this with a dotted box, and this usually leads directly into the final cadence. Most of these early Tricinia have cadences that emphasize the first and fifth modal degrees. Next slide, please. Um, however, G. Mixolydian, Chanson, and Tricinia in the 15th century, like Tujurma Sabiendra, have cadences on the first and fourth modal degrees, G and C, almost as often as they have cadences on the first and fifth degrees. Uh, next slide. And can you play it? Shall I go on? Uh, it's not, uh, yeah, well, um, uh, right now you're looking at the wrong piece. Uh, could you go back? Ah, it's allowed you. Ah, uh, yeah. And, uh, just play it, but, uh, stay on this slide. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, I don't hear anything. Oh, hold on a second. Maybe, maybe it's me. No, I have audio here. Um, do you see the little play button? Oh, play button. It's in the second measure in the top voice. Oh, this one. I see. Okay, thank you. majority of these early charchinia are in duple meter, and although some of them include a segment in contrasting triple meter in the second half, Tujur Musaviendra does not. Uh, this is, I trust, a faithful summary of the style that Polk refers to as early charchinia. He then goes on to discuss how Isaac took this style and transformed it during the later 1480s into what he calls mature charchinia. The question that I have is, where did this new style originate? Polk asserts that Martini developed this style in these pieces during the early 1480s or perhaps ever so slightly earlier. To be fair, Polk mentions a few other composers, but Martini was by far the most prolific of them. Is this where Martini first began to experiment with this new style or can we find earlier antecedents? This is the question that I will explore in the rest of this paper. Let us begin by follow, uh, examining the following piece by Martini. Next slide, please. No, just oh, sorry. There you go. Uh, it is a bit longer than the previous piece and does not fit well onto a single page. So I've split it onto two pages, each of, uh, next slide each of which represents about half the piece. Let us begin with the first half. Next slide, please. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. Uh, this piece as a whole has a great deal in common with Tujur Musaviendra. Next slide. It begins with imitation in all three voices. As we saw earlier, the imitation here is at the octave and fifth with the voices entering on D, D and A at different time intervals, two and then three briefs respectively. Next slide. After a short uh, passage in free counterpoint, there's a strong Phrygian cadence to E. At this point, Martini repeats the process. Next slide. There is another point of invitation, again in all three voices. However, it begins only on the unison and octave and the time interval between entries is therefore always the same. Uh, this imitation is followed by another passage in free counterpoint, somewhat longer than the first, that leads to a strong cadence on D, next slide, uh, less than halfway through the piece. The Secunda Pars continues to use a great deal of imitation, initially in only two voices and later again in all three. Next slide. The opening is a virtual tour de force of imitation. It begins rather simply with a cantus tenor in imitation of the octave, two breathes apart for four breathes. Next slide. Then Martini displaces a rest uh, in the two voices, 
see the circle rests here, which momentarily places the comas a brief and a half after the dux rather than two briefs. Next slide. After the cantus, after the rest in the cantus, the two voices are back at their, their original two brief distance and the imitation continues at the octave for almost four more briefs. At this point, next slide, the imitation abruptly shifts from being at the octave to being at the fifth and continues for almost seven more briefs. Manipulating the temporal and or intervallic distance between entries or other parameters of the imitation is characteristic uh, that Martini employed throughout his career. After a brief section in free counterpoint, next slide, there is a cadence to G. Next slide. At this point, there's a shift to triple meter, something that we did not see in Tujum of Yendra, but which is common in the secunda pars of many of his early trichinia. This triple meter section, which lasts to the end of the piece, begins with another example of imitation in all three voices. Next slide. Um, at uh, this time at the unison and octave on G with entries always one brief apart. Uh, next slide. After a brief rest, the top two voices continue with more imitation at the octave, uh, again, beginning on G and lasting until the penultimate measure where there's a strong oct octave leap cadence to D. This piece clearly has a great deal in common with Tujumus of Yendra and other early trichinia. The contratenor is more often than not an equal partner with the cantus and tenor and frequently participates equally in imitation. The piece could be a rondo quatrain with two very clear phrases in the first half, each beginning with three voice imitation and two longer phrases in the second half, the second of which begins with three voice imitation. There are no sequences in this piece, but the extraordinary amount of imitation in the second half, 31 of the 35 measures are imitative, may account for this. Next slide. Okay, now, Stefano, um, I've set up the next two slides as follows. If you just click, uh, don't do it yet, but uh, if you just click on your right arrow, it should start to play, follow along, and when it's done with this page, click the right arrow again, and you should be able to hear, uh, see the second page while the, uh, while the um, uh, recording continues. So click on okay. the right. Shall I play this now? Yes. <laughs> The right here. There you go.
Next slide. So what is this piece that so clearly resembles Polk's early Trichinia style? Next slide. It is the Ed Incarnatus from Martini's Misa Salasans Plu. Here's the first half with its text. The only surviving source for this mass is Badass 51, which likely was copied in the mid to late 1470s. The only surviving source for Tujo Musubiendra, on the other hand, is the Kasanatense manuscript, copied sometime during the 1480s, although the exact year has been difficult to pinpoint and remains somewhat contentious. For my purposes today, however, the exact date of Kasanatense is not essential. What is important is that Misa Salasan's Plu predates Tujo Musubiendra and all his other early Trichinia by at least a few years and perhaps by as much as a decade and a half. To be sure, this Ed Incarnatus is not a perfect correlate to Tujo Musubiendra. The most important differences between the two is in the lead up uh, to the cadence in the middle of both the first and second halves. In both cases, there is a duet. Next slide, please. In the first half, it is only two measures long. Next slide. But in the second half, it is seven measures. The shorter of the two is not imitative. Next slide. But much of the longer one is. Short duets, imitative or not, are found in about half of his trichinia. But extended duets, more than three measures, are not common and seem to be a holdover from his earlier pieces, such as La Martinella. A second important difference between these two pieces is that in the third phrase, the long one with a lot of imitation, the contratenor is again basically an accompaniment to the imitative upper voices, as in La Martinella. Although this Ed Incarnatus may not be a perfect correlate to Tujur Musavindra and his other early Trichinia, it is far closer in style to them than many of his other three voice mass sections, many of which resemble La Martinella far more closely than Tujur Musavindra. Next slide. Here, for example, is the second Agnus Dei from his Misa Orsu Orsu, also copied into Vat S51. Like La Martinella, next slide please. The majority of this piece is a, consists of two voice writing, mainly imitative, either for the top two voices or, next slide, the lower two voices. Only once is there imitation for all three voices, next slide, and then only very briefly. All of the imitation at this piece is either at the unison or octave, nothing at the fifth. Also like La Martinella, this Agnus Dei does not have a clear chanson form. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide, there we go. Uh, um, yes, perhaps the best way to interpret the style of the Ed Incarnatus from Misa Salasans Plu is as a transitional one similar to the way that he would organize and compose secular music in a few years, but still showing some of the characteristics of his very early pieces like La Martinella. The more progressive aspects of this piece, the imitation in three voices and the emancipation of the contratenor from its role as mere accompaniment are more important and to my ear more noticeable than the more retrogressive aspects, the long duet, or the contratenor occasionally acting as an accompaniment. This Ed Incarnatus further suggests that Martini made no obvious stylistic distinctions between his instrumental pieces, like Tujo Musaviendra, and his vocal pieces, like Misa Salasans Plu, nor between his secular and sacred pieces. To return briefly to Keith Polk, I believe he is correct to say that Martini established most of the outlines of this new approach, evidently about or by 1480. I would add that Martini seems to have experimented with this new style a little earlier in the early to mid 70s, 1470s, and not only in his secular instrumental pieces, but also in his sacred vocal music as well. Next slide, please. 
Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you very much, Murray, for a very interesting paper. Uh, I wonder if you would, um, just to begin the conversation, um, put this in context a little bit for us and uh, tell us how uh, your results um, um, fit, for lack of a better word, in the in the current debate on the relationship between instrumental music and vocal music at this time, or even even in the current debate on the on the uh, supposed origins of instrumental music to begin with. Okay, uh, I like the second part of that better. Um, the The current thinking has been that these new this new style that emerges uh, or that we start to see in the 1480s in um, collections such as the Casanatense and Florence Bancorari 229. Uh, what we had been talking about or what Keith Polk and others were talking about is that um, Martini and others developed this style in chanson or untexted uh, instrumental pieces uh, sometime during the early 1480s. What I'm trying to say is that he seems to be experimenting with this new style in which the contratenor is an, more or less an equal partner with the other two voices and that there is a lot of three voice writing and that uh, the form seems to be based on vocal forms. Uh, what, we, what, I seem to be, what I'm saying is that he seems to be experimenting with this new style earlier than the 1480s, in the 1470s, and actually in the three voice mass movements rather than um, first, rather than in um, either chanson or instrumental pieces. Thank you. Uh, what I find again fascinating here is the role that the mass may have played in this um, development. Uh, mm -hmm. Another of many instances of um, uh, what you may call um, um, separation of of a, of a kind of a spin off spin off uh, genre from a pre existing one. Um, do you, do you find this intriguing? Uh, the, oh, the, very, the role that the mass may have played here. Yes, I, I find it very intriguing. Uh, I find I think it it shows that. Uh, for, for Martini at any rate, and probably for uh, the bulk of composers, there was no distinction in style between a uh, sacred mass and a secular instrumental piece or very little distinction in style. Mm -hmm. And may this suggest once again, what we're connecting with what we were talking earlier about Claire's paper about the uh, uh, possible role of instruments in the performance of the mass um, yes that's... although I, I was I, I unfortunately I'm, I was I'm gonna write to Claire but I, I was so wrapped up with trying to resolve the technical issues that I was listening to Claire but I I, I was really concentrating on the technical issues so um, I didn't hear what she said about that but um, but yes I think that it, that is definitely something to explore much more fully than we have Think about it. Mm -hmm. Domande dalla platea. Questions? Claire? Yeah, she, she's, you're going to. Mari? Um... Yeah. yeah she's, she's speak. Okay. Um, am I right in remembering that um, Martini uses almost exclusively secular models in his masses? Is there just one example where he doesn't um uh let's see uh yeah, um yes i think that is correct it's pre predominantly secular models i was just wondering um does he treat these uh reduced texture sections any differently in the masses based on secular models versus um sacred uh no i don't think so okay Interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Other questions? Jesse? Thanks so much, Murray. Um, mm -hmm. I have a very little question, which is just about the earlier, the pieces that circulate in the earlier layer and whether any of those concluding sequences descend as opposed to ascend. Huh. Because I think, well, I'm curious if you have a sense for that. I don't have a sense for that off the top of my head. It would, I have, um, I, I could easily look that up and get back to you. Thanks. It's just, it's, it seems like the descending sequences are come a little later and that early on what, when they do them, they all go up. So it's a kind of interesting, oh. potentially interesting chronological marker, but it's cool to see them at ends of pieces regardless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a kind of concluding gesture because yeah. it becomes so important later on. Yes. Um, uh, I agree that I, um, my, my sense is that the majority of them are in fact, as you say, ascending, but I will double check to see if there are any descending. And then I will, I will send you an email. Thank you. It's really mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm wondering, Salah uh, Samplus as imitation at the fifth, right? And th is, this is probably the, so, so some of the earliest instances, the, the mid 1470s, where you start having imitation at the fifth to begin with, is that? So uh, I, I wonder if it's all connected with the, with the um, um, emergence of, I mean, I, I wonder if the emergence of instrumental style of these instrumental trichinia are somehow linked with the use of imitation at the fifth. Just, just a thought. Um, I wonder if there's a link that, there. I can't answer, but what I will say is that Martini relatively early on is really um, adept at, as, as we saw in that one passage, shifting from um, imitation at the octave to imitation at the fifth rather abruptly. And he does this in uh, his sacred music as well as his instrumental music. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Mary, for your presentation and for working through these technolog technological problems. Thank you. Thank you. So our last presentation now is uh, uh, by, again, by Jesse Rodin and uh, uh, the group Cut Circle. Um, and uh, that will illustrate for us um, issues of performance practice in Jean Scan, in uh, uh, the music of Jean Scan de Pre. So um, uh, I'd like to invite the singers. Yeah, I'm not going to invite them. Oh, oh, you're, okay. yeah, oh sure, you're going to invite them later. Okay, yeah. so uh, I understand that there will be a presentation by Jesse first, and then the singers will uh, come uh, in front of the uh, desk to illustrate some of the points here. So um, the title of this presentation is Performing Josquin in 2021, A New Approach. Oh, you have my text, by any chance? Yeah, the text. Uh, uh, would you like to see it here? Anywhere is fine. Okay. okay. No, no problem. Eh, mi dispiace se ho deciso di parlare in inglese per quel secondo intervento e perché così i cantanti capiscano, eh, ma se avete domande non esitare a fermarmi anche mentre parlo, non importa. Infatti volevo chiedere se possiamo spostare lo schermo, direi molto più vicino, perché così è impossibile vedere i dettagli. Grazie.
eh, non esitare a avvicinare un po' se volete, ma Actually, Brad, would you take, get two singers to come up and arrange the stands while I'm talking? If you want stands, might be nice. Whatever, maybe on this side, whatever you like. Potrei dire almeno la prima frase in italiano è che il mio secondo intervento è di nuovo su un argomento su cui tutti sembrano avere un'opinione. <ride> la stessa cosa in inglese. Ok. No. Does that work? The one that's clean, not in columns. Okay. Bene, wherever you think that they should go, I don't care. Okay, comincio. Eh. Okay, bene. Performing polyphony. Talk about another subject on which everyone has an opinion. So many factors conspire against honest engagement with the problem. A dearth of contemporary sources about performance practice, musical sources that fail to tell us many, the many things that singers of the period didn't need to be told, and a series of interlocking modern performance traditions that can't help but impinge on our thinking. Today, I would like to ask, can we do anything to get closer to a sound for Josquin that does justice to the music's aesthetic goals. For the past several decades, performances of Josquin's vocal music have favored an approach developed in the United Kingdom in the 1970s by David Woolston and expanded in the early 1980s by groups such as the Talis Scholars and the Hilliard Ensemble. This approach has much to recommend it. Good tuning, rhythmic accuracy, and vibrato-free singing that makes it possible to hear the individual lines all features that helped spark an appreciation of Renaissance music by a generation of enthusiasts and scholars, myself included. By now, most of Josquin's securely attributed works are available in high quality recordings that adopt this general performance style. Still, with every approach come benefits and costs and significant drawbacks can be associated with a sound that emerged out of the bel canto and Anglican choral traditions and through experience with much later 16th century repertories. On reflection, it seems likely that however attractive, the sound for Renaissance polyphony made popular some four decades ago and still in vogue today would have been unfamiliar to listeners in the years around 1500. For the period of Josquin's activity as a musician, let's call it 1460 to 1520, we possess a wealth of musical sources alongside payment records, legal documents, a handful of visual depictions of singers, and a few treatises, letters, and so on, offering insights about performance aesthetics. This may sound like a lot, but as is well known, in most cases, it is difficult or even impossible to draw firm conclusions. Even where firm conclusions are possible, we must always ask how far they apply. On some topics, after all, what was po popular in Florence may have been unthinkable in Arezzo. One of the richest texts we have, and also a good example of the challenges the surviving evidence poses, is the 1471 treatise De Modo Bene Cantandi by the German theologian and preacher Konrad von Zabern. At first blush, this treatise, the earliest known manual of practical singing technique, would appear to contain a wealth of information. Most tantalizing, as Joseph Dyer has noted, is the impressive number of injunctions Conrad makes, prohibitions. And as we all know, writers who attack 
do so because the practices they are attacking are prevalent, common. He doesn't like rough, coarse singing, which he associates with rural environment, environments. It is better to be refined, that is, urbane. In particular, Conrad hates it when singers hold high notes longer than others, when they use the extremes of their ranges, when they sing ha animalisma, ha 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 ha, no. when they sing the wrong vowel, damine deus, and when the singing is nasal, forced, not together, or out of tune. He is also against, Chito, singing high notes with an unstintingly full and powerful voice, a style he goes on to call careless and to liken to shouting, which leads him to compose this hilarious couplet. Like cows in the meadow, so do you in the choir bello. Come nel campo le mucche, quindi voi in coro mugite. At the same time, Conrad doesn't like it when musicians sing sleepily and lifelessly. He advocates animated, affective, joyful performances. So you see those ideas are actually in conflict. Conrad's text is, is marvelous, but I can think of at least four reasons why we should treat it with caution. First, he is writing not for professional polyphonists, but for monastic singers performing liturgical chant. The aesthetic principles he articulates may simply not be relevant to polyphony. Second, Conrad is a churchman and a reformer who openly opposes non-notated polyphony, as well as the introduction of vernacular songs into the liturgy. This is not a treatise by someone who would have appreciated the polyphonic masses sung at the court of Ercole d'Este. Third, Conrad is German. Compared to Milan, Rome, or Condé sur Lescaut, he is working in polyphonic backwaters, Strasbourg, Basel, Mainz. Can we really take his views on singing as representative? Fourth, his criticisms, I think in particular of his dislike of powerful trumpet-like voices, may point to practices that were ac actively cultivated by enthusiasts. Indeed, reading between the lines, it seems likely that loud, demonstrative, showy, trumpet-like singing was common, even if many conservative churchmen didn't like it. It is worth emphasizing these points because some have been too quick to read into texts like Conrad's aesthetic values that they themselves would like to see projected onto the music of the distant past. Aesthetic values that, to paraphrase Christopher Page, may tell us above all about modern academic sensibilities. Paradoxically, Page himself tends to reify those sensibilities in his performances. Which brings us to a second and ultimately more important issue, the too often unexamined origins of the modern sound for early music. I have been listening to early recordings of English choral ensembles, which includes some extremely beautiful examples. I have also been reading about the origins of what we call the bel canto technique, including a fascinating dissertation by Sarah Potter on English vocal pedagogy. Let me summarize what seem to be the most salient points. And I have to thank also the singers in the ensemble, some of you whom have helped me figure out the right language to use for describing what I'm about to describe. And it's an ongoing conversation because there's so many ways of talking about the voice because the way we talk about the voice is so often metaphorical. Today, most teachers of classical voice instruct their students to lower the larynx, passare la laringe. Doing so facilitates a round, resonant, and extremely attractive sound. But in fact, the cultivation of a low laryngeal position in the West is a very recent phenomenon, dating only to the 1830s, as we learn from the Spanish singer and vocal pedagogue, Manuel Garcia. Historically speaking, the 1830s are yesterday. It is impossible to imagine the pervasive application of this technique in the years around 1500. Now let us consider the Anglican choral tradition, which inspired groups like the Tala scholars. By the beginning of the 20th century, the spacious low larynx had been naturalized as an aesthetic ideal. What is interesting is what happens when choir boys learn to sing in this aesthetic context. Boys naturally have smaller voices with little, little or no vibrato. The best English choirs were therefore able to produce an often stunningly beautiful, pristine, angelic sound, a sound that is rounded, resonant, and relatively clear. When applied to Renaissance polyphony, the absence of vibrato in particular 
allows the individual lines to be heard, which seems like a sine qua non for this repertoire. Thus, the early music sound is born. All the Tala scholars had to do was adapt this same sound to professional adults. I am passing over a lot and I am simplifying a lot, but I want to insist that this is a core piece of the puzzle. If we approach the time of Josquin through the idea that a low laryngeal position was, although certainly possible, probably not cultivated as a default, we find ourselves in unfamiliar aesthetic waters. Unlike classical singing today, in which the throat is pervasively open, as when we yawn, oh, we are talking about a more closed throat, a speech-like space within the vocal tract that depends on a brightening of the vowels and together with a neutral or high larynx creates a perceived brightness of timbre. Some of us have been taught to believe that this forward high laryngeal approach sounds rough or untrained as with a folk or pop musician. But of course, we all know and appreciate other uses of the voice. And we all know that many pop singers are highly trained. There is a reason that we love Stevie Wonder and Mia Martini. It also can't be totally irrelevant that no one naturally speaks with a low larynx and that the overwhelming majority of vocal traditions around the world prefer a high or middle larynx a speech-like approach, which is used to create many different effects. Let's take a brief survey of just a few polyphonic traditions internationally. We're gonna go around the world for a moment. Here, thanks to the wonders of YouTube, is an example from Ukraine. Maybe. Uh from Madagascar. From the Pyrenees. two examples that are especially interesting because they feature high laryngeal production and reverberant acoustics. Here's an example from southwestern China, an ensemble performing in a church, I think, in the United Kingdom. And now something many of you will know more about than I do, a canto a tenore from Sardegna. Heterogeneous mix, where I see a connection to what has circled. 
widespread preference for what Tommy Gumbrecht has now called pleasure. Hear a bright, extroverted sound that brings the details of the music literally and metaphorically forward. It's not only about the larynx. From the period we have descriptions of public crying of a kind that today would make most of us blush, weeping in the streets, right? We have extreme, ex extreme expressions of emotion were not just common, but required. We also have shalms and crumb horns, double reed instruments that create wonderfully bright, forceful sounds. We have images of singers standing close to one another, deep in concentration, whether by De La Robbia or Van Eyck. This last one is from the Ghent altarpiece is the cover of our forthcoming album of anonymous masses. I picked this image for a reason. None of this evidence points to the blended, distant, dark, polite, emotionally detached style that is so common today. I wonder how much of this style is about the emergence of the early music performance tradition out of buttoned up Oxford and Cambridge. And I wonder how much of it is about fear, fear of displaying emotion in the context of academics and of older conservative audiences. So now the question becomes, once we strip away that for which we have no supporting evidence, what is left? And how do we adapt what is left to the needs of this repertoire? Let's remind ourselves of some basics. As many wonderful ensembles since the 1970s have demonstrated, this music rests on a foundation of perfect intervals whose tuning must surely have been a priority at the time. It is also a virtuosic repertoire in which the singers must collectively establish a stable beat against which everything is calculated. Visually, the singer receives no information about what the other voices are doing. To paraphrase a comment of David Fallows, Whereas in Schumann, there are many bar lines, but you ignore them. In this repertoire, there are none, but they are extremely important. Pace Thomas, Thomas Binkley, rhythmic accuracy is indispensable. If you have performed a piece like this, same one, from the original sources, this is Josquin's Virgo Salutiferi, which we'll do in a minute, you will know that with this repertoire, you must cultivate and revel in rhythmic precision lest the train go off the rails. It's not for nothing that they called it musica mensurabilis. A related issue is adopting tempi that are supported by the sources. The Talas scholars helped establish the convention that the criste of a mass should be sung more slowly than the first Kyrie. This is wrong. Josca and his contemporaries usually notate the first Kyrie under circle, tempus perfectum, a modern triple meter. For the Christe, they usually switch to cut C, a faster duple meter. The effect is acceleration, not deceleration. Also problematic in the modern performance tradition is the interpretation of music notated under the sign three. Tre. In fact, Interpretation is the wrong word, word, as there is a very simple right and wrong in this case. One measure, three beats, under three, is equivalent to one measure, two beats, under cut C, always. But most ensembles sing sections under three too fast, even to the point of willfully ignoring the rhythms in modern editions. Taking these problems together, the modern performance tradition is overwhelmed by tempos for cut C that are significantly too slow and tempos for three that are somewhat too fast. We can hardly expect the music to make sense if we consistently misconstrue these very basic mensural relationships. Indeed, Josquin's phrases, which as I've argued elsewhere, are calculated to produce strong effects, lose all their poignancy when performed much too slowly or much too quickly. Only with a plausible range of tempi do we stand a chance of understanding the flow of the music. Now, with, this, with these principles in place, let me at long last invite the singers to join me up here. As they come up, I want to begin by thanking them. I am beyond lucky, I really mean this, I'm beyond lucky to work with such extraordinary musicians and such wonderful people. And I, I will add here that part of this is a, 
it the kind of approach we take depends on a trust between us that would not be possible if we didn't actually like each other. Their backgrounds are varied. Some have naturally brighter sounds than others. Some have more experience than others with non-Western, classical, or pre-1830s training. Several of them teach voice. All are brilliant technicians and all are willing to experiment. But the main point is that each of these singers fully commits and that each has a strong, unique sound. With a uniform approach to vowel production and placement, those heterogeneous sounds can blend, but without merging into a homogeneous mass. Let's begin with the piece I showed a moment ago, Virgo Salutiferi. The opening of this motet responds to the word tonantis, thundering, but only when we allow ourselves to approach it that way. I'm wondering if one of you could follow along with the slides as we do it. It's, I have the score here. So it's maybe too small, but what I thought we'd do is sing uh, the beginning, and you can look if you want. So look at the next. Oh yes, nice. Thank you for uh, doing this one. fairly famous, more famous piece that has been recorded by many ensembles. Here is a version by the Clarks. Our approach is very different responding, first of all, to the text, which is very silly. Una mancanza di soldi e un dolore senza violenza. Yeah, okay. So what I'm gonna ask is for each of the singers to sing their first phrase alone, 
for you to hear different approaches, because the idea is not one, but a multiplicity of sounds. So, and I guess, yeah, so. Faute d'argent, ces douleurs n'ont pas de marks 500 years since Chopin's death, but only about 50 years in modern times since performances of his music became relevant and widespread. Over the next 50 years, I suggest we have our work cut out for us. Much to do. The first step is easy. 
abandon our Franco holy texts and reverential pantheons. From there, we drop off a cliff. Since for so many performance questions, it's impossible to identify the right answer. Instead, the challenge will be to seek out new voices, new vocal techniques, and new stylistic approaches for the sake not of creatively cannibalizing an existing musical tradition that sounds cool, but of discovering new ways of bringing the details of this specific repertoire to life. Up to a point, this project is unavoidably presentist, but when the work proceeds from deep engagement with the music and the musical sources, and benefits from thousands of hours of thoughtful rehearsals and performances, it also becomes meaningfully historical. Indeed, my plea is that we muster the courage to take the past seriously, to honor the music by bringing to bear all of our intellectual and creative capacities. At the very least, we can start by abandoning that which we know to be wrong. Thank you. Grazie a voi. E così magari stanno qui, così se avete domande magari possiamo rifare qualcosa anche se volete. Siamo pronti a, a fare ciò che volete. Well, grazie, thank you for a very compelling argument that you are uh, proposing. Uh, I find that the, the most immediate benefit is the clarity in the delivery of the text, mm. which is usually a shortcoming in these performances. You, you, you don't hear the text so clearly. And uh, with this approach, that to me is certainly among other, everything that you've talked about, mm -hmm. yes. just the clarity of delivering the text to me is just light years uh, light years. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And, and I didn't have time to say it, but I said a little that the, the text actually is important for, for, well, because initially Josquin was thought to be kind of the first madrigalist. And orator, this is- The musical orator, right? Yeah, and that's wrong, in part because it, that idea emerged from late spurious motets, okay. But then in a way we, some of us, went back to this idea that he's really 15, earlier 15th century idea and the text is something that's important in a very different way. Uh, in a Dufay kind of way. And now I think, at least for me, I'm back to the middle where the text is important in that 15th century way, but also in a way where he's often very sensitive to the specific, to the individual words he's setting, but also and always to the overall affect, to the overall feeling of the text. Faute d'argent is different from Virgo Salutiferi, obviously, but it's not just genre. It's also the, the, the emotion and some of what we are doing, a lot of what we're doing is trying to find in each piece, what is the emotional register? What is the place he's, is it a joke? Is it angry? Is it serious? But to do that, you have to know a lot of pieces. It's not easy. And sometimes it takes us a while to find what we think could be a right answer. There's not always one. Thank you. Domande dalla platea. Oh, uh, John Nadash, thank you. Present sound. Um, if one wanted to, can you lower the nasality of the sound or increase it? Can <laughs> so we try an experiment? It's really a question best answered by them. But I think let me start by answering yes, that nasality does not have to accompany brightness. That in fact, it's not putting the sound in the nose, but resonating it up. And Brad really maybe would be the person to say something if, he, if he's willing to do better than I can do. You mind coming to the mic and doing it? If you don't mind. Whatever. <laughs> The question of nasality is complicated. Um, I think none of us are singing with uh, what would be considered a, a nasal vocal technique. So we're not singing into the nose. We are singing in a way that is, very, as Jesse said, very high and forward. In the bel canto technique, we open the top of the throat 
and create in, in the nasopharynx, so the top of the throat, the, the back, back of the nose, this big open round space. What we're doing is we're actually suppressing that. We're keeping it down to the natural speech um, uh, organization, palatal organization. So we can increase or decrease brightness of timbre by changing vowel shape, but I wouldn't say that it's nasal. Um, as it, there's, there is a, a quality that is similar to that, but it isn't exactly nasality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's almost nasality, but not quite. Or you could do a complete nasality. And all of these are options to create affect. And what we're exploring is how to cultivate a flexible vocal technique that uses different laryngeal positions and different openness or closed functions within the throat, essentially. Is the, is the larynx a bit higher or a bit more in the middle or is it even lower? Are we creating a round sound or are we complete, completely creating almost more of a horizontal sound, which we've done in, this, in these examples more. And we're exploring that a lot more considering the idea that this way of singing, this direct way of singing might have, might have been uh, relevant. And we know that it's relevant to myriad singers around the world that are not trained in the bel canto technique. And certainly that we assume that technique was not used, the bel canto technique was not used 500 years ago. So uh, this is what's brought us here. And I hope that answers the question somewhat. It's complicated. Uh, there was a question from uh, Cecilia. Grazie per questi, per questi due interventi che veramente in, in particolare questo che sconvolge le nostre categorie, no? Abbiamo, insomma, per anni abbiamo studiato, abbiamo ascoltato la musica con questa impostazione e abbiamo, diciamo, eh, in, eh, individuato Joe Scan come il primo che apre la strada al rapporto tra testo e musica. Io sono una, diciamo, eh, mi interesso, faccio ricerca nell'ambito della poesia per musica de, nel madrigale, no? nei rapporti tra, tra testo e musica. E eh, diciamo il punto di partenza era proprio forse questo qua, Joe Scan. Eh, e l'ingresso della chanson, della tradizione di Joe Scan in Italia che si incontra con la poesia italiana e crea questo, diciamo, questo connubio no? da cui nasce la grande tradizione, il grande rapporto tra testo e musica. Ecco, ora, di fronte a questa affermazione, eh, eh, mi domando io qual è allora, um, la strada no? da cui inizia questo, questo rapporto tra testo e musica, cioè non è più Josquin, e c'è qualche ipotesi che ha fatto, insomma. È una buona domanda, ma è difficile. A un certo punto torniamo, torniamo a un'idea di Josquin come uno fra i compositori più importanti, importanti che introduce qualche concetto sulle relazioni musicali e testuali, che, ma non sempre, è quello che è difficile, ma nella seconda parte della sua carriera comincia, comincia davvero a fare una relazione molto vicina e uh, diverso, ad esempio, abbiamo appena, appena ma <ride> prima di Covid, abbiamo registrato tutte le canzoni di Ockeghem, e nelle canzoni di Oke, anche da, da, dalle canzoni di Ockeghem si trova una relazione testuale molto intima, molto intensiva, ma non è, quel, ma non è questa. Uh, Josquin comincia a trovare un modo per fare, co come faranno i, i madrigalisti, ma non con questa età scendit che sale ogni volta, non è così one to one, è, 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 più to, è, è un po' più astratto, ma direi che siamo uh, su, sul percorso. Non, non è iconico, è retorico. Forse. Ecco, ecco, di, di sicuro, sì, sì. Sì, sì. 
mimicking the image of the text is more theatrical or rhetorical. Sì. So. E dipende dalla genera, perché eh, ne, nella messa, allora, è un, è un mondo un po' diverso, ma non così tanto, perché troviamo un po' le stesse cose. Eh, il credo, ad esempio, è molto ritorico nelle mani di Josquin. Ah, Kiri è magari un po' diverso, perché il testo è corto, ma quando arriviamo a, a, ai movimenti con, con testo, lui, fa, lui trova le soluzioni. Genitum non factum, consubstanziale empatico. Fa, fa sempre qualcosa molto interessante qua. Pre, eh, trova una soluzione che che sì esatto che capitalizza sull'energia del testo direi uh, non è legato al, 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 al senso al significato necessariamente Ah, ah, sì. ah, sì, perché qua comincia davvero la tradizione sì, sì, del mandirale. Mm. Sì. No. sì, 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 sono d'accordo, grazie. Uh, grazie. C'era una domanda da Camilla, credo, o no? Ah. Thank you so much to everybody, all the singers for the examples and for this uh, explanation about your research. I was uh, wondering um, if you also are exploring uh, the rhetorical sources, for example, because the, the pronunciation. Um, so I, I think that my, is my personal opinion. I really appreciate your approach. Um, and I also thought in the past, uh, as I, uh, I was an ethnomusicologist in my past, so in the Italian uh, tradition, we have many polyphonic tradition who also explored this, um, this kind of emission of the voice. Uh, and uh, when I thought that the, 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 the young women, they, they really um, also have this pronunciation very high with the sound clear, etc., which is also similar to the some certain Italian tradition. And I think that it, it, so you explore the sound, the clarity, uh, so this principle about the uh, throw, and I think the, I, I thought uh, is also the rhetoric and the aspect of the contemporary sources, uh, something interesting for your research? That's a, another great question. Thank you, Camilla. Um, it is interesting, but it is very difficult because the problem, and, I, and maybe if I, if I continue, I'll find more, but the problem so far I find is that the rhetorical treatises, for example, based to a large extent on classical models, limit themselves to a kind of, you know, the idea of the peroration, like a conclusion, right? So, of course, this is an idea that we could map onto Josquin's conclusions. He is the master of the conclusion. Okay, so in that sense, absolutely, there is a, a connection, but I don't usually find convincing when people try to say this part is these measures and this part is these measures. And the reason I think, fund well, there are two reasons. The first is that rhetorical treatises are not written with music in mind, right? But I, the, the second reason is basically the same, that music is its own language. And I think the problem is that it's so tantalizing to think about these connections. They exist on some level, absolutely, but maybe it's a danger we have of sort of wanting to find evidence in another sphere that can't help us beyond a certain point. Beyond that point, we're just trying to make music fit it. And that actually what we need to find is music's own internal rhetoric. And the only way we can do that is through comparison and experience. But it's, it's scary and it's, it's, I, you know, it's like I want to keep going back to these treatises to see maybe there's a little more to squeeze, you know, but it feels very abstract to me for now. Thank you. John Nadash. Oh, sorry. No, um, I wanted to ask, uh, what happens when you're not using one voice to a part, but you have, let's say four, 
or, or how it, the I mean, are the issues and problems complicated and uh, and accumulated? How do you get the same vocal quality from different singers singing the same part? That's another great question. So first thing I'll say is that I increasingly think that Josquin wants one on a part, basically. Now, Joshua and I are friends, so you understand, even though it's not Bach. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that having been said, there are certainly situations. Okay, I, we, yes. I think that our approach, and again, they'll be better at answering, but I think our approach begins from an agreement about vowels and placement. If you sing the same vowel, truly the same vowel, then you come to each other sound in a way that with two is difficult. Uh, it's actually easier with more, although more to me, there's too, it's too cloudy <laughs> usually. But, um, but you can come to each other sound. Still, some pairs will work better than other pairs just naturally based on what the voice is like. Um, but we're doing that less and less. Uh, and it's partly because I found these people who have voices that are so strong and uh, stable ind individually that they don't need support. And if anything, having another person forces you to restrain your energy to meet them instead of letting your own energy out. Does that seem more or less fair? Yes. It, they must have worked with, uh, let's say, four boys singing the top part. Yeah, that's uh, right. To produce the same same sound. Right. Right. She was talking. Sonia was talking about how when we have mixed ensemble with women, uh, there is an added layer of complexity because. Women's voices and men's voices, yeah, finding timbral continuity is more difficult. Uh, boys, of course, boys aren't used everywhere, right? They're often male falsettists, but um, boys, it's, it's, another, it's another situation. And it would be fun to have a little experimental place where we would take you know, six-year-olds and hopefully not beat them, but work with them every day for, for a year or two or three until they were at a level where they could do this and it was like nothing, it was easy. And if we could, we could see, but boys, some boys who are trained in the right way can produce very powerful sounds. There's some story about Emma Kirkby not wanting to sing a duet with a boy from Germany because he was gonna blow her out of the water, <laughs> just one. So uh, even there, it's this question of what's the sound we have in our head? For those boys and where does that come from maybe that comes from a world where they're hearing grown-ups who are around it and that's a different world from my son was in a choir briefly in in california and there was a rehearsal i used to sit in the back and do and do work but the conductor heard them singing with this natural sound and right away she says no, no make a beautiful sound <laughs> okay, what does a beautiful sound actually mean it means dropping the larynx that's what she's telling them to do she doesn't say that she shows it and then they get copy. So that, uh, if I may, poison is injected early. I'm kidding, but that idea is injected early and people are made to feel shame about singing another way. Uh, but if we take that away, then boys, it could be not so far. Right, that's good. Right, so Sonia's saying that the, the matching boys and men would present some of the same challenges so, so they probably ha they had to deal with that one way or the other. Yeah, yeah, that's very good. Grazie, thank you so much for this presentation. It was, re it was really enlightening. I, I so much appreciate having the opportunity to have this conversation, especially right here in, yeah, in Arezzo. So thank you so much, all of you. you. Really. This brings our conference to an end. I think we all agree it's been three days of uh, quite stimulating and productive uh, presentations. I'd like to thank all the participants and the performers, all the technical uh, people who have greatly helped us. Grazie a tutti, sto parlando inglese adesso. Grazie a tutti, davvero, e soprattutto la Fondazione per il supporto a ogni livello.
per questo evento. Grazie a tutti anche voi per essere intervenuti. E, uh, possiamo, possiamo adesso uh, ascoltare altri, altri, altre esecuzioni stasera e domani. Vorrei ricordare l'esecuzione di Cat Circle domani sera alle sei e mezza in San Michele. E stasera c'è Odecaton, adesso qui c'è Odecaton, vero? Ah, anche, anche, anche Odecaton è a San Michele. Ah, ok, An anche Odecaton è a San Michele, stasera alle sei, alle sei e trenta. Grazie di nuovo, arrivederci. Grazie di nuovo, arrivederci.